Hello and welcome back to a chapter a day where a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play. I am your hostess, Miss Petals, and welcome to another installment of Fahrenheit 451. What that was an exciting read last time, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Yes, it was. So to recap, um Faber who we're introduced to as I guess we can call him Montag's friend he has a butt in his ear not Faber but Montag to where he can communicate with Faber and while he's communicating he tells Montag to go ahead and go back to work which we find out is a big mistake BD, we find out, was in a, was in on it the whole time, not knowing about Faber until we get to Mondag's house. But we find out that Captain BD had already had it in for Montag, and they head off for another fire, aka burning of the books, but this time the call is for Montag's house. We find out that Mildred was the one who called it in. And she pretty much packs her bags and gets the heck out of there. <laughs> and uh, we find out that BD finds out that Montag has been talking with Faber. And is told to burn his own house down. And once he is finished, he would be under arrest. But Montag throws the flamethrower that's given to him towards BD and f fillets him <laughs> pretty much a fillet o BD I'm sorry that's not supposed to be funny but then we find out that after committing murder he kills the beast or as uh he calls it the hound the mechanical hound which is was programmed by BD to hurt Montag but with the flamethrower Montag kills the hound and so now we left him with the three remaining firemen the fire truck and himself and it sounds like he might do the same thing to the firemen and the truck and that's where we left off last time. Before we continue tonight, I just want to go over Montag scripture, which is Luke 12, 27. Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And I told you all that I wanted you all to think, I want you to think about what that scripture could mean and to Montag personally and why that scripture. We kind of go over it a little bit. And I want you to keep that scripture in your mind as we continue reading Fahrenheit 451 and why that scripture would be so important. Also, I wanted you all to think about does this world of Montag's reflects our own? Is our world becoming the world of his of Fahrenheit 451? Or do we still, you know, are we I, right, you know, this is just fiction? Or are we super close? Or are there similarities to our world and his? I could name a few, but we'll talk about that later. But for now, let us continue on with Fahrenheit 451. He stood, and he had only one leg. The other was like a chunk of burnt pine log. 
I forgot to mention that the hound before he died, before it died, it had used its poisonous, um, I guess you can call it a fang, but it's really a needle to where it, it used to, before it died, would kill animals like rats or anything it, that it crossed, used this needle and would inject the animal with poison letting it die and then once it died it would throw it in the furnace now before the mechanical hound died it used its needle and got to uh montag's leg so i'm sorry i didn't recap on that but that's what's happening right here the poison in his is in his leg and it is starting to take hold he stood and he had only one leg the other was like a chunk of burnt pine log he was carrying along as a penance for some obscure sin. When he put his weight on it, a shower of silver needles gushed up the length of the calf and went off in the knee. He wept. Come on, come on, you, you can't stay here. A few house lights were going on again down the street whether from the incidents just past or because of the abnormal silence following the fight montag did not know he hobbled around the ruins seizing at his bad leg when it lagged talking and whimpering and shouting directions at it and cursing it and pleading with it to work for him now when it was vital he heard a number of people crying out in the darkness and shouting he reached the backyard and the alley beady he thought you're not a problem now you always said don't face a problem burn it irony am i right folks well now i've done both goodbye captain and he stumbled along the alley in the dark. A shotgun blast went off in his leg every time he put it down. And he thought, you're a fool. A damn fool. An awful fool. An idiot. An awful idiot. A damn idiot. And a fool. A damn fool. Look at the mess. And where's the mop? Look at the mess what do you do pride damn it and temper and you've junked it all at the very start you vomit on everyone and on yourself but everything at once but everything one on top of another beady the woman mildred clarice everything no excuse, no, no excuse. A fool, a damn fool. Go give yourself up. No, we'll save what we can. We'll do what there is left to do. If we have to burn, let's take a few more with us. Here. He remembered the books and turned back just on the off chance. He found a few books where he had left them, near the garden fence. Mildred, God bless her, had missed a few. Four books still lay hidden where he had put them. Voices were wailing in the night and flash beams swirled about. Other salamanders were roaring their engines far away and police sirens were cutting their way across town with their sirens montag took the four remaining books and hopped jolted hopped his way down the alley and suddenly fell as if his head had been cut off and only his body lay there something inside had jerked him to a halt and flopped him down he lay where he had fallen and sobbed, his legs folded, his face pressed blindly to the gravel. Beatty wanted to die. 
in the middle of the crime, Montag knew it for the truth. Beatty had wanted to die. He had just stood there, not really trying to save himself. Just stood there, joking, needling, thought Montag. And the thought was enough to stifle his sobbing and let him pause for air. How strange, strange to want to die. So much that you let a man walk around armed and then instead of shutting up and staying alive, you go on yelling at people and making fun of them until you get them mad and then, at a distance, running feet, Montag sat up. Let's get out of here. Come on, get up, get up. You just can't sit. But he was still crying, and that had to be finished. It was going away now. He hadn't wanted to kill anyone, not even Beatty. His flesh gripped him and shrank as if it had been plunged in acid. He gagged. He saw Beatty, a torch, not moving fluttering out on the grass he bit at his knuckles i'm sorry i'm sorry oh god sorry he tried to piece it all together to go back to the normal pattern of life a few short days ago before the sieve and the sand denim's dentrifus moth voices fireflies the alarms and excursions too much for a few short days too much indeed for a lifetime feet ran in the far end of the alley get up he told himself damn it get up he said to the leg and stood the pains were spikes driven in the kneecap and then only darning needles and then only common ordinary safety pins and after he had shagged along fifty more hops and jumps feeling his hand with sil slivers from the board fence the prickling was like someone blowing a spray of scalding water on that leg and the leg was at last his own leg again he had been afraid that running might break the loose ankle. Now sucking all the knife into his open mouth and blowing it out pale. With all the blackness left heavily inside himself, he set out in a steady jogging pace. He carried the books in his hands. He thought of Faber. Faber was back there in the steaming lump of tar that had no name or identity now. He had burnt Faber, too. He felt so suddenly shocked by this that he felt Faber was really dead. Baked like a roach in that small green capsule, shoved and lost in the pocket of a man who was now nothing but a frame skeleton strung with asphalt tendons. You must remember, burn them or they'll burn you, he thought. Right now, it's as simple as that. He searched his pockets. The money was there, and in his other pocket, he found the usual seashell upon which the city was talking to itself in the cold black morning. Police alert. Wanted. Fugitive in city has committed murder and crimes against the state. Name, Guy Montag. Occupation, fireman. Last seen, he ran steadily for six blocks in the alley, and then the alley opened out onto a wide, empty thoroughfare, ten lanes wide. It seemed like a boatless river frozen there in the raw light of the high, white arc lamps. You could drown trying to cross it, he felt it was too wide. It was too open. It was a vast stage without scenery, inviting him to run across. Easily seen in the blazing illumination, easily caught, easily shot down. The seashell hummed in his ear. Watch for a man running. Watch for the man. Watch for the running man. 
Watch for a man alone, on foot. Watch. Montag pulled back in the shadows. Directly ahead lay a gas station, a great chunk of porcelain snow shining there, and two silver beetles f pulling in to fill up. Now he must be clean and presentable if he wished to walk. Not run, stroll calmly across that wide boulevard. It would give him an extra margin of safety if he washed up and combed his hair before he went on his way to get where. Yes, he thought, where am I running? Now, no, nowhere. There was nowhere to go, no friend to turn to, really, except Faber. And then he realized that he was indeed running toward Faber's house, instinctively. But Faber couldn't hide him. It would be suicide, even to try. But he knew that he would go to see Faber anyway, for a few short minutes. Faber's would be the place where he might refuel his fast draining belief in his own ability to survive. He just wanted to know that there was a man like Faber in the world. He wanted to see the man alive and not burned back there like a body shelled in another body. And some of the money must be left with Faber, of course, to be spent after Montag ran on his way. Perhaps he could make the open country and live on or near the rivers and near the highways in the fields and hills. A great whirling whisper made him look to the sky. The police helicopters were rising so far away that it seemed someone had blown the gray head off a dry dandelion flower. Two dozen of them flurried, wavering indecisive, three miles off like butterflies puzzled by autumn, and then they were plummeting down to land, one by one, here, there, softly kneading the streets where turned back to beetles. They shrieked along the boulevards or as suddenly leapt back into the air, continuing their search. And here was the gas station, its attendants, busy now with customers. Approaching from the rear, Montag entered the men's washroom. Through the aluminum wall, he heard a radio voice saying, War has been declared. The gas was being pumped outside. The men in the Beatles were talking and the attendants were talking about the engines, the gas, the money owed. Montag stood trying to make himself feel the shock of the quiet statement from the radio, but nothing would happen. The war would have to wait for him to come to it in his personal file. An hour, two hours from now, he washed his hands and face and toweled himself dry, making little sound. He came out of the washroom and shut the door carefully and walked into the darkness and at last stood again on the edge of the empty boulevard. There it lay, a game for him to win, a vast bowling alley in the cool morning. The boulevard was as clean as the surface of an arena two minutes before the appearance of certain unnamed victims and certain unknown killers. The air over and above the vast concrete river trembled with the warmth of Montag's body alone. It was incredible how he felt his temperature could cause the whole immediate world to vibrate. He was a phosphorescent target. He knew it, he felt it, and now he must begin his little walk. Three blocks away, a few headlights glared. Montag drew a deep breath. His lungs were like burning brooms in his chest. His mouth was sucked dry from running. His throat tasted of bloody iron and there was rusted steel in his feet. What was, what about those lights there? Once you started walking, you'd have to gauge how fast those beetles could make it down here. Well, how far was it to the other curb? It seemed like a hundred yards. Probably not a hundred, but figure for that anyway. Figure. With 
figure that with him going very slowly at a nice stroll, it might take as much as 30 seconds, 40 seconds to walk all that way. The Beatles? Once started, they could leave three blocks behind them in about 15 seconds. So even if halfway across, he started to run. He put his right foot out and then his left foot and then his right. He walked on the empty avenue. Even if the street were entirely empty, of course, you couldn't be sure of a safe crossing for a car could appear suddenly over the rise four blocks further on and beyond and past you before you had taken a dozen breaths. He decided not to count his steps. He looked neither to left nor right. The light over light the light from the overhead lamp seemed as bright and revealing as the midday sun and just as hot he listened to the sound of the car picking up speed two blocks away on his right. Its movable headlights jerked back and forth suddenly and caught at Montag. Keep going. Montag faltered, got a grip on the books, and forced himself not to freeze. Instinctively, he took a few quick running steps, then talked out loud to himself and pulled up to stroll again. He was now half across the street, but the roar from the Beatles' engines whined higher as it put on speed. The police, of course, they see me. But slow now, slow, quiet. Don't turn, don't look, don't seem concerned. Walk, that's it. Walk, walk. The beetle was rushing, the beetle was roaring, the beetle raised its speed, the beetle was whining, the beetle was in high thunder, the beetle came skimming, the beetle came in a single whistling trajectory, fired from an invisible rifle, it was up to 120 miles per hour, it was up to 130 at least. Montag clamped his jaws, the heat of the racing headlights burnt his cheeks, it seemed and jittered. His eyelids and flushed the sour sweet out all over his body. He began to shuffle idiotically and talk to himself, and then he broke and just ran. He put out his legs as far as they would go, and down and then far out again, and down and back and out and down and back. God, God, he dropped a book, broke past, almost turned, changed his mind, plunged on yelling and cut. In concrete emptiness, the beetle scuttle, scuttling after its running food. 200, 100 feet away, 98, 70, Montag gasping, flailing his hands, legs up, down, out, up, down, out, closer, closer, hooting, calling. His eyes burnt white now as his head jerked about to confront the flashing glare. Now the beetle was swallowed in its own light. Now it was nothing but a torch hurtling upon him, all sound, all blare, now almost on top of him. He stumbled and fell. I'm done. It's over. But the falling made a difference. An instant before reaching him, the wild beetle cut and swerved out. It was gone. Montag fl lay flat, his head down. Wisps of laughter trailed back to him with the blue exhaust from the beetle. His right hand was extended above him, flat. Across the extreme tip of his middle finger, he saw now as he lifted that hand. A faint sixteenth of an inch of black tread where the tire had touched in passing. He looked at that black line with disbelief, getting to his feet. That wasn't the police, he thought. He looked down the boulevard. It was clear now. A car full of children, all ages. God knew from twelve to sixteen out whistling, yelling, hurrahing, had seen a man, a very extraordinary sight, a man strolling a rarity and simply said, let's get him. Not knowing he was the fugitive, 
Mr. Montag simply a number of children out for a long night of roaring five or six hundred miles in a few moonlit hours, their faces icy with wind and coming home or not coming at dawn, alive or not alive. That made the adventure. They would have killed me, thought Montag, swaying the air, still torn and stirring about him in dust, touching his bruised cheek for no reason at all in the world. They would have killed me. He walked toward the far curb, telling each foot to go and keep going. Somehow he had picked up the spilled books. He didn't remember bending or touching them. He kept moving them from hand to hand as if they were a poker hand he could not figure. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He stopped and his mind said it again very loud. I wonder if they were the ones who killed Clarice. He wanted to run after them, yelling. His eyes watered. The thing that had saved him was falling flat. The driver of that car, seeing Montag down, instinctively considered the probability that running over a body at such a high speed might turn the car upside down and spill them out. If Montag had remained an upright target. Montag gasped. Far down the boulevard, four blocks away, the beetle had slowed, spun about on two wheels, and was now racing back, slanting over on the wrong side of the street, picking up speed. But Montag was gone, hidden in the safety of the dark alley, for which he had set out on a long journey, an hour, or was it a minute ago? He stood shivering in the night, looking back out as the beetle ran by and skidded back to the center of the avenue, whirling laughter in the air, all about it gone. Further on, as Montag moved in darkness, he could see the helicopters falling, falling like the first flakes of snow in the long winter to come. The house was silent. Montag approached from the rear, creeping through a thick, night-moistened scent of daffodils and roses and wet grass. He touched the screen door, in back found it open, slipped in, moved across the porch, listening. Miss Black, are you asleep in there? He thought. This isn't good, but your husband did it to others and never asked and never wondered and never worried. And now, since you're a fireman's wife, it's your house and your turn for all the houses your husband burned and the people he hurt without thinking. The house did not reply. He hid the books in the kitchen and moved from the house again to the alley and looked back and the house was still dark and quiet, sleeping. On his way across town with the helicopters fluttering like torn bits of paper in the sky, he phoned the alarm at a lonely phone booth outside a store that was closed for the night. Then he stood in the cold night air waiting and at a distance he heard the fire sirens start up and run and the salamanders coming, coming to burn. Mr. Mr. Black's house while he was away at work to make his wife stand shivering in the morning air while the roof let go and dropped in upon the fire but now she was still asleep good night Miss Black he thought Faber another rap a whisper and a long waiting then after a minute a small light flickered inside Faber's small house after another pause, the back door opened. They stood looking at each other in the half-light, Faber and Montag, as if each did not believe in the other's existence. Then Faber moved and put out his hand and grabbed Montag and moved him in and sat him down and went back and stood in the door, listening. The sirens were wailing off in the morning distance. He came in and shut the door. Montag said, I've been a fool all down the line. I can't stay long. I'm on my way, God knows where. 
At least you were a fool about the right things, said Faber. I thought you were dead. The audio capsule I gave you burnt. I heard the captain talking to you, and suddenly there was nothing. I almost came out looking for you. The captain's dead. He found the audio capsule. He heard your voice. He was going to trace it. I killed him with the flamethrower. Faber sat down and did not speak for a time. My God, how did this happen? said Montag. It was only the other night everything was fine and the next thing I know I'm drowning. How many times can a man go down and still be alive? I can't breathe. There's Beatty dead, and he was my friend once. And there's Millie gone. I thought she was my wife, but now I don't know. And the house all burnt, and my job gone, and myself on the run. And I planted a book in a fireman's house on the way. Good Christ, the things I've done in a single week. You did what you had to do. It was coming on for a long time. Yes, I believe that. If there's nothing else, I believe. It saved itself up to happen. I could feel it for a long time. I was saving something up. I went around doing one thing and feeling another. God, it was all there. It's a wonder it didn't show on me like fat. And now here I am messing up your life too. They might follow me here. I feel alive for the first time in years, said Faber. I feel I'm doing what I should have done a lifetime ago. For a little while, I'm not afraid. Maybe it's because I'm doing the right thing at last. Maybe it's because I've done a rash thing and don't want to look the coward to you. I suppose I'll have to do even more violent things, exposing myself so I won't fall down on the job and turn scared again. What are your plans to keep running? You know the war's on, I heard. God, it's funny, said the old man. It seems so remote because we have our own troubles. I haven't had time to think. Montag drew out a hundred dollars. I want this to stay with you. Use it any way that'll help when I'm gone. But I might be dead by noon. Use this. Faber nodded. You'd better head for the river if you can. Follow along it, and if you can, hit the old railroad lines going going out into the country follow them even though practically everything's airborne these days and most of the tracks are abandoned the rails are still there rusting i've heard there are still hobo camps all across the country here and there walking camps they call them and if you keep walking far enough and keep an eye peeled, they say there's lots of old Harvard degrees on the tracks between here and Los Angeles. Most of them are wanted and hunted in the cities. They survive, I guess. There aren't many of them, and I guess the government's never considered them a great enough danger to go in and track them down. You might hole up with them for a time and get in touch with me in St. Louis. I'm leaving on the 5 a.m. bus this morning to see a retired printer there. I'm getting out in the open myself at last. This money will be put to good use. Thanks and God bless you. Do you want to sleep a few minutes? I'd better run. Let's check. He took Montag quickly into the bedroom and lifted a picture frame aside, revealing a television screen the size of a postal card. I always wanted something very small, something I could walk to, 
something I could blot out with the palm of my hand if necessary. Nothing that could shout me down, nothing monstrous big. So you see, he snapped it on. Montag, the TV set said and lit up M-O-N-T-A-G. The name was spelled out by a voice. Guy Montag, still running. Police helicopters are up. A new mechanical hound has been brought from another district. Montag and Faber looked at each other. Mechanical hound never fails. Never since its first use in tracking quarry has the incredible invention made a mistake. Tonight, this network is proud to have the opportunity to follow the hound by camera helicopter as it starts on its way to the target. Faber poured two glasses of whiskey. We'll need these. They drank. Nose so sensitive the mechanical hound can remember and identify 10,000 odor indexes on 10,000 men without resetting. Faber trembled the least bit and looked about at his house, at the walls, the door, the doorknob, and the chair where Montag now sat. Montag saw the look. They both looked quickly about the house, and Montag felt his nostrils dilate, and he knew that he was trying to track himself, and his nose was suddenly good enough to sense the path he had made in the air of the room and the sweat of his hand hung from the doorknob, invisible but a numerous as the jewels of a small chandelier. He was everywhere in and on and about everything he was a luminous cloud a ghost that made breathing once more impossible he saw faber stop up his own breath for fear of drawing that ghost into his own body perhaps being contaminated with the phantom exhal exhalations and odors of a running man a mechanical hound is now landing by helicopter at the site of the burning and there on the small screen was the burnt house and the crowd and something with a sheet over it. And out of the sky fluttering came the helicopter like a grotesque flower. So they must have their game out, thought Montag. The circus must go on, even with war beginning within the hour. He watched the scene, fascinated, not wanting to move. It seemed so remote and no part of him. It was a play, a part, and separate, wondrous to watch, not without its strange pleasure. That's all for me, you thought. That's all taking place just for me, by God. If he wished he could linger here in comfort and follow the entire hunt on through its swift phases, down alleys, across streets, over empty running avenues, across lots and playgrounds, with pauses here or there for the necessary commercials, up other alleys to the burning house of Mr. and Miss Black, and so on finally to this house with Faber and himself seated, drinking, while the electric hound snuffed down the last trail, silent as a drift of death itself skidding to a halt outside that window there then if he wished montag might rise walk to the window keep one eye on the tv screen upon the window lean out look back and see himself dramatized described made over standing there lined in the bright small television screen from outside a drama to be watched objectively knowing that in other parlors he was large as life in full color dimensionally perfect and if he kept his eye peeled quickly he would see himself an instant before obliv oblivion being punctured for the benefit of how many civilian parlor sitters who had been wakened from sleep a few minutes ago by the frantic sirening of their living room walls to come watch the big game 
the hunt, the one-man carnival. Would he have time for a speech? As the hounds seized him, in view of ten or twenty or thirty million people, mightn't he sum up his entire life in the last week in one single phrase or a word that would stay with them long after the hound had turned, clenching him in its metal plier jaws and trotted off in darkness while the camera remained stationary, watching the creature dwindle in the distance? A splendid fade-out. What could he say in a single word, a few words, that would sear all their faces and wake them up? There, whispered Faber, out of a helicopter glided something that was not machine, not animal, not dead, not alive, glowing with a pale green luminosity. It stood near the smoking ruins of Montag's house, and the men brought his discarded flamethrower to it and put it down under the muzzle of the hound. There was a whirring, clicking, humming. Montag shook his head and got up and drank the rest of his drink. It's time. I'm sorry about this. About what? Me? My house? I deserve everything. Run. For God's sake, perhaps I can delay them here. Wait, there's no use you being discovered. When I leave, burn the spread of this bed that I touch. Burn the chair in the living room in your wall incinerator. Wipe down the furniture with alcohol. Wipe the doorknobs. Burn the throw rug in the parlor. Turn the air conditioning on full in all the rooms and spray with moth spray if you have it. Then turn on your lawn sprinklers as high as they'll go and hose off the sidewalks. With any luck at all, we can kill the trail in here anyway. Faber shook his hand. I'll tend to it. Good luck. If we're both in good health next week, the week after, get in touch. General Delivery, St. Louis. I'm sorry there's no way I can go with you this time by earphone. That was good for both of us. But my equipment was limited. You see, I never thought I would use it. What a silly old man. No thought here. Stupid, stupid. So I have not another green bullet. The right kind to put in your head. Go now. One last thing. Quick, a suitcase. Get it. Fill it with your dirtiest clothes, an old suit, the dirtier the better, a shirt, some old sneakers and socks. Faber was gone, and back in a minute, they sealed the cardboard valise with clear tape to keep the ancient odor of Mr. Faber in, of course, said Faber, sweating at the job. Montag doused the exterior of the valise with whiskey. I don't want the hound picking up two orders at once. May I take this whiskey? I'll need it later. Christ, I hope this works. They shook hands again and going out the door, glanced at the TV. The hound was on its way, followed by hovering helicopter cameras, silently, silently sniffing the great night wind. It was running down the first alley. Goodbye and Montag was out the back door, lightly running with the half-empty valise. Behind him, he heard the lawn sprinkling system jump up, filing the dark air with rain that fell gently and then with a steady pour all about, washing on the sidewalks and draining into the alley. He carried a few drops of this rain with him on his face. He thought he heard the old man call goodbye, but he wasn't certain. He ran very fast away from the house, down toward the river. Montag ran. He could feel the hound, like autumn, come cold and dry and swift like a wind that didn't stir grass, that didn't jar windows or disturb leaf shadows on the white sidewalks as it passed. The hound did not touch the world. It carried its silence with it. So you could feel the silence building up a pressure behind you. All across town, Montag felt the pressure rising and rain, rising and ran. He 
stopped for breath on his way to the river to peer through dimly lit windows of wakened houses and saw the silhouettes of people inside watching their parlor walls and their and there on the walls the mechanical hound a breath of neon vapor spidered along here and gone here and gone now at elm terrace lincoln oak park and up the alley toward faber's house go past thought montag don't stop go on don't turn in on the parlor wall faber's house with its sprinkler system pulsing in the night air the hound paused quivering no montag held to the window sill this way here the procane needle flicked out and in out and in a single clear drop of the stuff of dreams fell from the needle as it vanished in the hound's muzzle montag held his breath like a doubled fist in his chest the mechanical hound turned and plunged away from faber's house down the alley again montag snapped his gaze to the sky the helicopters were closer a great blowing of insects to a single light source with an uh, with an effort montag reminded himself again that this was no fictional episode to be watched on his run to the river it was in actuality his own chess game he was witnessing move by move he shouted to give himself the necessary push away from this last house window and the fascinating seance going on in there hell and he was away and gone the alley a street the alley a street and the smell of the river leg out leg down leg out and down twenty million montags running soon if the cameras caught him twenty million montags running running like an ancient flickery keystone comedy cops robbers chasers and the chased hunters and hunted he had seen it a thousand times behind him now twenty million silently baying hounds ricocheted across parlors three cu three cushion shooting from right wall to center wall to left wall gone right wall center wall left wall gone Montag jammed his sea shell to his ear. Police suggest entire population in the Elm Terrace area do as follows. Everyone in in every house, in every street upon a front or rear door or look from the windows. The fugitive cannot escape if everyone in the next minute looks from his house. Ready? Of course. Why hadn't they done it before? why in all the years hadn't this game been tried everyone up everyone out he couldn't be missed the only man running alone in the night city the only man proving his legs at the count of ten now one two he felt the city rise three he felt the city turn to its thousands of doors four the people sleepwalking in their ha hallways five he felt their hands on the doorknobs the smell of the river was cool and like a solid rain his throat was burnt rust and his eye were wept dry with running he yelled as if he this yell would jet him on fling him the last hundred yards six seven eight the doorknobs turned on 5,000 doors. Nine. He ran out, aw out away from the last, now last row of houses on a slope leading down to a solid moving blackness. Ten. The doors opened. He imagined thousands on thousands of faces peering into yards, into alleys, and into the sky. Faces hid by curtains, pale, night-frightened faces like gray animals peering from electric caves. Faces with gray colorless eyes, gray tongues, and gray thoughts looking out through the numb flesh of the face. But he was at the river. He touched it 
just to be sure it was real. He waded in and stripped in darkness to the skin, splashed his body, arms, legs, and head with raw liquor, drank it and snuffed some up his nose. Then he dressed in Faber's old clothes and shoes. He tossed his own clothing into the river and watched it swept away. Then holding the suitcase, he walked out in the river until there was no bottom and he was swept away in the dark. He was 300 yards downstream when the hound reached the river. Overhead, the great racketing fans of the helicopters hovered. A storm of light fell upon the river, and Montag dived under the great illumination as if the sun had broken the clouds. He felt the river pull him further on its way into darkness. Then the light switched back to the land. The helicopters swerved over the city again as if they had picked up another trail. They were gone. The hound was gone. Now there was only the cold river and Montag floating in a sudden peacefulness, away from the city and the lights and the chase, away from everything. And we're going to stop for today. Wow, you guys. Ain't that something? They only going to come outside, get away from their screens, to go find a, a, what do you call them? A fugitive. There you go. And they made it like a game. Like, okay, everybody. And the count of ten, we're going to find these people. We're going to find that fugitive. You ready, kids? That's all I had to say. Are you ready, kids? It's horrible. Oh, man, there's so much I wanted to cover. Like... When he was running and those kids almost hit him and didn't care if they hit him. They wanted to hit him. Like, I'm sorry I keep saying like, y'all, I'm trying to get better. But it was horrible. Like, it <laughs> did it again. <laughs> you guys, I'm just going to be real. It's like today. Like, kids are not caring anymore. I mean, I don't know. This is old news, but there was, I think one was 12 and the other was, what, 14? And they were shooting at police. And come to find out, they wanted to be like that Grand Theft Auto game. They wanted to be like that. And they didn't care who got hurt. And as I'm further reading the story with you all, it's, there are a lot of similarities to Montag's world to our world. I mean, when we were reading about him being on the run and them making it to entertainment. Uh, I don't know if you all know, all you 90s people would know, um, there used to be a show called Cops. And sometimes they would have police chases. And I used to love that show. I would watch it with my cousins. <laughs> and I got to admit, you know, I that was entertainment to me. Like helicopters chasing one person and then cop cars chasing people. I mean, that was fun to me back then. But now it's like, nan you know, reading this story... That's not fun. It's n and it's not supposed to be entertainment. It's criminal. I mean, the show Cops was about people being arrested. But we've decided to make that entertainment. People make bad decisions in life. Should it be broadcast? I don't know. You guys let me know. And... As we can see, Fahrenheit 451 is more than just about books. It's about a society where there's more attention on entertainment than reality. I mean, 
these people in Montag's world, there's a war that's been declared. War has been declared. But yet they want to focus on Montag and make an entertainment about that and dis- and make the war a second issue. And I do believe when we uh, read further that it is going to affect, it will be a number one issue. Because we've been reading about this war getting ready to start during Montag's whole story. During the whole story of Fahrenheit 451. And I think them not paying attention to it and only focusing on fun and happy, happy things and happy thoughts is going to lead to their downfall. Just like with Captain B, his whole thing was to just burn every book, burn everything that doesn't make people happy, burn everything that starts arguments and disagreements, just let everything be happy. And all these people who read books and think they're so intelligent, you know, get rid of them. Get rid of, you know, everybody's equal. Everybody's, let's keep them at the status quo. But when you do that, as we've read so far, you create this world of chaos. Chaos and unhappiness. They're thinking they're, this world of entertainment and do whatever you want is happy and it's not happy. If it was happy, there wouldn't be all these problems. You wouldn't burn books. You wouldn't, you know, you would be okay with people not agreeing with you. You wouldn't burn people's houses. Sounds like our world today. (laughs) It really does. And I don't know about you all, but that is pretty scary to me. And I don't know if you guys were thinking the same thing I'm thinking, but a 12 year old driving a car, I mean, I guess there's no laws either. (laughs) Cause, uh, don't you have, yeah, you have to be 21 no 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 I'm sorry no you you have to be 15 years old to get a permit and then you can get a license at at 16 I don't know each state is different where I'm at it's you can get a permit at 15 and then you can go ahead and get your license at 16 but imagine a world where 12 year olds were driving and then they was like oh I want to Oh, uh, drive recklessly. Let, let's hit this guy. <laughs> Thinking that it's Mario Kart. So apparently there's no laws in Montag's world either. Or there are and they don't make sense. They can burn books, but a 12-year-old can drive and run over people and it'll be alright. So going back to... Montag scripture in Luke 27. I hope you guys uh, know why the scripture is so powerful. Because it's usually a scripture for people who worry about God. Like what shall we eat and what shall we drink? Don't worry about that stuff. He says, consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not, they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Oh, I keep doing that. I'm sorry. But if you know, if you guys know the story of King Solomon, Solomon was asked by God. Wait, sorry. God asked Solomon, like, what would you have of me, Solomon? Like, what do you want from me and I shall give it to you and Solomon wanted wisdom and so Solomon was a very rich man if you take a really look at uh Solomon's life in the book of Kings he was very rich okay very well off and but he was well known for his knowledge and this scripture is saying 
that even the lilies of the valley God takes care of. Even Solomon, with all his great greatness and all his riches and knowledge, God still takes care of the lilies of the field, and they're beautiful. That's what pretty, I'm paraphrasing the scripture so you all can understand, and I'm trying to break it down so you all can understand. But it's a great scripture for those who worry, and uh, that's a that's a great scripture for Montag to read because he this man's got a lot of worries but yet he survived all of that he survived all of that I know this is not a Christian book but the scripture fits so well with him that even though this world is falling apart his world is falling apart and his world doesn't make sense and they think happiness is just getting whatever you want and just doing whatever you want to do and just be entertained just and even though his world doesn't make sense God still takes care of things and that's that scripture his scripture reflects on our world today and unfortunately Montag's world and this world are very similar <laughs> I hate to say it but it is but even though this world is crazy right now even though it's crazy right now and things don't make sense, make sense and laws are being passed that don't really don't make any sense even God, if God can still take care of the lilies, what's so for us? What's safe for us? Because whether we believe it or not, he did create us. And from what we just read, God has taken care of this man. Like, even though it's fictional, I mean, he escaped two hounds. He escaped helicopters. He escaped being run over by kids in a car. And I don't know if you notice all of his old life of what he thought was happy is gone. But yet he had a real friend after he lost everything. He had a real friend in favor. So... I forgot to mention earlier today, I, before our reading, that a chapter a day is sponsored by the Seeds of Harvest Library, located in 4121 Cleveland Street, Gary, Indiana, inside Market City, Friday and Sunday, 10.30 a.m. to 4 o'clock p.m., Saturday, 10.30 a.m. to 4.30 p.m. They do accept donations, but please hardcover books only and you can follow them on facebook and social all social media platforms that you see on this screen here and as always this is a chapter a day where a chapter a day keeps ignorance at bay and imagination at play this is miss petals have a good night you all <laughs>